Hello, and welcome back to Breaking Badness. In today's episode, we're exploring the complex world of vulnerability management, cyber resilience, and supply chain security. Vulnerabilities like Log4j have shown us the critical need to manage risk. And we'll explore why this isn't just a technical problem, but also an organizational challenge. We've got some incredible guests sharing their expertise today, including Jacob Graves, Director of Solution Architecture at Gutsy, Teresa Lanowitz, Chief Evangelist at Level Blue, who will shed light on the state of cyber resilience in 2024. We'll also hear from Pukar Hamel, CEO at SecurityPal, and Vinay Anand, Chief Product Officer at NetSpy, as they explore supply chain security nth party risk and proactive security approaches. With your hosts, Callie Fensel, Sean McNee, and Daniel Schwabe, let's get started on today's journey into the challenges and innovations in modern cybersecurity. So I guess, first of all, what is vulnerability management? Yeah, so it's looking for any kind of weaknesses you have in the packages you use or in the operating systems that you use. So if you hear about CVEs or things like that, or vulnerabilities like Log4j, those are all the kind of vulnerabilities we want to manage. We want to find those vulnerabilities, detect them in some way, give them to the right developer or operator to be able to build a patch and deploy a patch and remove that weakness from the server or the software so it doesn't become exploited by attackers. Very cool. What, what would you say is a myth that you'd like to debunk about vulnerability management on the podcast? I, I don't know if it's a myth, but it's way harder than people even think it is. You would think, oh, it's easy. You, you get an alert about a vulnerability, you build a patch and you deploy. And especially as vendors, we get into that mindset sometimes where we're like, oh, we detected the vulnerability. It's all on you now. It's, <laughs> that's not like the reality. The reality is it's very difficult organizationally to not just find the vulnerability, but find the right person to assign that vulnerability to, to build the patch and then coordinate with the business to get the rollout to actually go out to production most of the time to remove that vulnerability. It's not a technology problem. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of times an organizational problem just to get everybody aligned on the importance of security. And the trade-off on it is usually at the expense of building a new feature, or responding to some customer need or business need that you have. So really balancing that and making sure that you can attack it the right way and actually get the priority that you need is a really important thing. And sitting on the other side of the fence as somebody who's charged with securing the enterprise, love nothing more than a patch coming out. I'm like, okay, fine, we'll schedule it in, rank it across priority, severity, whatever. And then a day later, oh, no, there's another patch because, oh, wait, we didn't quite get it the first time. Yeah. I'm like, really? Are you kidding me now? Yeah, Log4J was a great yep. example. It was like, oh, it's, it's this CVE. This is what we need to patch. And you did, and they're like, actually, yeah, yeah. actually, we didn't know what was vulnerable before. Now we know exactly what it is. And and it's uh, all hands on deck, and, and they aren't all polite and coming in on a Monday morning or something. It'll be Friday night, and something will get published, and oh, the weekend's lost, and we got to bring everybody in to do that. So I want to ask, and I'm going to establish some acronyms, because we, we don't have enough acronyms here. Just for our listeners, JK. in case, <laughs> hello, in case they're not familiar, TRR, mean time to repair, and MTTD, mean time to detect. What are they and why are they crucial for vulnerability management? Yeah, so those are two metrics you want to look at when you're measuring how effective your vulnerability management program is. So mean time to detect is how long it takes you to actually detect a vulnerability once it goes out. So maybe you deploy a new server and then you have to find if that server has vulnerabilities in it or you deploy a new container. Now, getting that as quick as possible will reduce risk for the organization. The other one, MTTR, which can also be mean time to remediate, is how long it takes you to actually deploy a patch and remove that vulnerability. And obviously, in an ideal world, both those numbers would be like zero or one, mm -hmm. one hour or whatever it is. But in reality, they're way longer. So we tend to split those based on the criticality of the vulnerability. Critical vulnerabilities, we might set an SLA or a, a target time that we want to have things patched, so two weeks or something like that. If it's a critical in production on these whatever systems you deem as being critical or crown jewels, you want to have them patched in a certain amount of time and get that deployed. And so mean time to remediate or mean time to detect is how we measure those. Cool. And so what are challenges in reducing? A thousand different challenges you could have <laughs> List there. them all. Number one, no, really it's just finding the right people to be able to build that patch and then convincing or communicating within the business that they should actually do it. Because it is, like I said, at the expense of a lot of other things. And it's why it's important for the security team or the security group or department to not be the department of no and just shutting down everything that you have. No, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this. Instead of working with them, building that rapport so when there is a real, actual, legitimate vulnerability, you can use your political capital there to go and convince them to actually build the patch or deploy the patch, build the fix, whatever you want to say. 
I love hearing that because that's exactly my philosophy. Like when I first went into the CISO chair at Domain Tools, I put out my philosophy early on and like security should not be the department of no. Yes. So I love hearing that because <laughs> I firmly believe that. Cyber resilience is one of those things. It's in the collective zeitgeist, the conversations that we're having right now. You hear a lot about resilience, being able to recover when something bad or something catastrophic happens. Mm -hmm. So we think about cyber resilience, and the word cyber is in front of it, but it is really about the entire IT estate. And it's how that IT estate can recover and also cope with being taken out. And it is something that could be man-made. It's some type of catastrophic event that could be a natural disaster, a hurricane, a fire, a flood, an earthquake, yeah. or some type of cyber event. So the CIO, the CTO, and the CISO, all those three C-suite members that have a stake in the overall IT estate really need to be able to come together and what we're seeing so much of is we're seeing innovative use cases that go beyond the perimeter of the organization. Yeah. The perimeter is dissolved. It's been dissolved for many years. And we see all this innovation happening. In healthcare, for example, we see remote patient monitoring with wearable devices. We see autonomous drones, autonomous vehicles. In manufacturing, we see robots on the floor helping yeah. with manufacturing process. We see a lot of smart buildings where you can do preventive maintenance so that you're not taking an elevator out in the middle of the day when the building's full. So you know that elevator needs servicing. You can say, we're going to do this on a Sunday afternoon when nobody's here. Mm -hmm. So those are all the innovative types of use cases that we're seeing out there. And each, the CIO, the CTO, and the CISO, have a different view on them, right. and they work differently inside the organization. I was actually going to, that, you led me right <laughs> into my next question. I was going to ask you, like, how do they differ in, in the context of cyber resilience? If we look at the I.O., the CIO is really about the business of technology. How is this technology going to run my business, regardless of the type of business to consumer, business to business? The CIO is about the business of the technology. Okay. The CTO is about innovation. The CTO is thinking, how can I innovate to deliver better experiences for our customers, regardless yeah. of who they are? And then the CISO, the Chief Information Security Officer, that CISO is really about the security operations, making sure that the, everything is secure from an operational perspective and make, making sure that the proper cybersecurity protocols and cybersecurity controls are implemented. While they may seem as though they're very similar, they yeah. are, in fact, pretty different, and they have different priorities as well. Yeah, and I would assume they have to get along in order for this to work. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely have to get along. And that's one of the big things that we uncovered in this research is that there's not necessarily a whole lot of cross-functional communication between the CIO, the CTO, and the CISO. Really? In fact, from a cyber resilience perspective, we found that 72% of governance organizations, so those are the people making the rules about how your company operates, yeah. they don't know what cyber resilience is. And they often conflate it with cybersecurity because the word cyber is there. Yes. <laughs> so they're not looking at it being a whole organization issue. So if a fire comes in and takes something out within your IT estate, those teams have to come together, work together to bring everything back up from the cybersecurity perspective, from the business perspective, from the innovative perspective. And would you say, does the CEO have a stake in this at all, or is it really just those three? The CEO definitely has a stake in it. The okay. CEO is, if you will, the one who is assessing and is really going to be able to make that decision. Okay. But one of the problems we see is that CISOs, the Chief Information Security Officers, often they don't report directly into the CEO. Really? In many cases, they report into the CIO. So Interesting. while we talk about the fact that cybersecurity is a board level issue, it's something on everybody's mind, the CISO is often not reporting to the CEO. And what we also found out in our research, and this was absolutely shocking to me because the cybersecurity community is tremendous. It is an awesome community. It's done incredible work over the past two, yeah. three decades. But what we found out is that cybersecurity is still often siloed, so yeah. living very much in a silo, overlooked and underfunded. Mm -hmm. So that means that their budgets are not proactive. Right. There's some type of external event, like a breach happens, yeah. and they'll get more money. Mm -hmm. So they're overlooked, they're siloed, they're not built into the whole project. So when a project starts, 
and everybody's around the table saying, these are the requirements, here's what we need to do from a functional perspective, here's what we need to do from a performance perspective or a networking perspective. Yeah. The, the security team is frequently not there, and yeah. so you end up bolting security on at the end, and that's when we start to have problems. I'll bring it back to the, the level blue report. So we talked a little bit about the barriers, but according to the report, what are the main barriers to achieving cyber resilience that you know, identified? Yeah, if we look at that, governance teams don't know what cyber resilience is. It's not a whole organization issue right now because yeah. governance teams aren't embracing it. Oftentimes it's conflated with cybersecurity. Yeah. And across the board, we surveyed seven different industry verticals for this, healthcare, retail, finance, manufacturing, transportation, energy and utilities, and U.S. state, local, and higher education. Yeah. And across the board, all those different industries told us the same thing. It's not a whole organization issue. We can't get funding for it. And so when something catastrophic happens, suddenly you, you find a way to come together. The, C, the CEO suddenly realizes, I have these leaders. I have the CIO. I have the CTO. I have the CISO. They should be working together yeah. rather than separately. Yeah. And, and I apologize if this is an ignorant question. It's Is this a newer term, cyber resilience? I yeah, It's a term that we started hearing a lot about resilience and cyber resilience probably around the time of the pandemic. Okay. So right around the time of the lockdown, think about every business out there. Every business had to figure out a way to do things differently Yeah. because everybody was in lockdown mode. So think about just yeah. the places you go to on a regular basis. We saw grocery delivery. Yeah. Never had grocery delivery in many cases before yeah I know in the neighborhood where I lived during the pandemic there was this one restaurant an excellent restaurant <laughs> and you would say to them prior to the pandemic can I get takeout no our food is it, it has you know, to be here in the it's atmosphere. art yeah it's <laughs> art. you have to enjoy it in the atmosphere yeah we can't possibly to be, do takeout but within two days of lockdown they suddenly had a way to do takeout oh so <laughs> businesses had to pivot they had to be resilient in the face of something we had never seen before. We had never seen anything like the pandemic. No. And that just continued on because within a lot, what that triggered was this idea of digital transformation. You know, we're going to go down this path of digital transformation. And oh, by the way, security is at the core of digital transformation. And what we're seeing now, and this is something we found in our research, is that the vestiges of incomplete digital transformation projects, they're hanging around and the CISO is really not quite sure what to do with them because there's still a lot of unfinished business. Yeah. So that's something that organizations really need to take stock in as well. So I'm the founder and CEO of SecurityPal. I started the company one full time, like March of 2020. So that's like the date that we've all stuck by. Interesting times to start a company, I would say. Yeah. Uh, a lot going on at that point in the world. I really, I don't have a security background. So it was not like an ex or anything like that. And really, I was a co-founder of a previous company in the HR tech space. We were dealing with a lot of PII, like personally identifiable information. And this was around 2018 where I started like seeing a lot more scrutiny about our product, more from the security and GRC lens. and. A lot of that was because of GDPR. I had hit May of 2018 that year, and I think the story that really sticks out at me is it was like the end of the quarter, we were all trying to close a big deal, and we thought we were gonna get it. It was gonna be company defining in many ways. And when I was at that company, and at the 11th hour, we get like a 200 page like security questionnaire from, <laughs> um, from the company, and that like completely just killed the deal. And that was like a painful sort of scar tissue that I like carried on to the, the startup security pal, which was like, hey, like, I totally understand companies need assurance before they bring on a vendor partner. Vendor partners obviously also need to close revenue. There's these competing trade-offs. How do we actually make it really easy for companies to complete these security reviews, questionnaires, really fast while also providing a lot of assurance to their customers and that was the sort of mission that we set out to solve and here we are four years later continuing at it. I can tell you the security review questionnaires that we receive on a regular basis, customers and partners, at least I appreciate them, but they are uh, a bit much. Mm -hmm. um, I for one greatly welcome improvements in this space. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's something that I think a lot of the industry is wrestling with right mm -hmm. now. Yeah, the, the insight that I've had is I think there, there's a sort of like belief that, oh, is this just like a checkbox exercise? There's some people yeah. that view it as, well, I got to check these boxes in order to make some folks and some teams happy. 
there, there's also this like very real need for a company to make sure that its vendors are adhering to the, the minimum security controls that they have that they expect right yeah. especially if you're storing or processing any type of sensitive data and i think like for me you know as, as a co-founder of my previous company being closer to maybe like the gtm side of the house i, I brought this like unique sort of understanding which is you know i, I really look at the space as hey like this is this, I think we could really jujitsu this into an opportunity to put security and GRC and these organizations as really like revenue drivers within companies rather than just historically being looked at as cost centers because mm -hmm. a company's need to be assured actually should have a cost associated with that, should have a price associated with that. If you want maximum assurance, if mm -hmm. you want maximum transparency, there should be some type of monetary value attached to that now how do we actually do that right instead of just pushing work on to, onto our vendors hey fill out this questionnaire or something like that how do we actually get the attention of our vendors in the right way so i think we're in this very interesting place where we're trying to think through those economic incentives and everything like that i think the paperwork will eventually go away it'll be automated it'll be continuous <laughs> monitoring but but that assurance piece will always be there uh, and i think there will be actually significant amount of monetary value attached to that at that last mile of the commercial transaction where assurance is really needed. And, mm -hmm. and it's not enough to just have it once. So I think we all talk about zero trust. I think it gets thrown around a lot. And I yeah. think trust does have this sort of like binary connotation, right? Mm -hmm. Whether you trust or you don't. But I think like in the way that companies transact, you can't really fully trust the vendor ever. You want, you need continuous assurance from them. Mm -hmm. And because the folks on their end change, the, their technology changes and everything like that. So you can't just be like, oh, we assessed this vendor last year. We should be good for the next 10 years. That doesn't, it doesn't work <laughs> like that. It's no longer binary. Like I do really do believe that we're in this era where it's going to have to be continuous. You're going to have to continuously provide assurance to your customers and assurance to yourself and other business leaders as well. And continuous checks, continuous monitoring. And um, I think we'll all be safer because of that. I think in some weird sort of, paradoxical way, maybe there will be more trust than ever before because of zero trust. Extending this further, right? So it's not just vendor customer, but vendors of vendors. And now you're starting to get chains of trust. Yeah. Right. So is there like a, a vision of saying I as new end customer or working with a vendor, but now I can see this automated chain they have through their supply chain. Yeah, yeah. We talk about nth party risk all the time, right? At, at Security Pals. I think TPRM, third party is maybe from this era where, where you really only had third parties, there was no parties outside of that, but because of cloud software, because of the various clouds, you have sub-processors of sub-processors of sub-processors. And I think this is like very much top of mind, right? Anytime there's a incident that happens with, with any company in the world, you know, we have several Fortune 1000s and talk to the CISOs and I always say, it doesn't matter if, if that company that had that breach, if they're not a vendor of yours, mm -hmm. I almost can guarantee you that they are a vendor of one of your 1000 vendors. Oh, and, and like, they are somewhere in that supply chain. And so we should definitely assess the blast radius mm -hmm. of that event. And really, I think we are going to get to this world once we get to continuous monitoring and, and some of the things that we're trying to figure out and, and work on at Security Pal, where you're going to be able to go down to that sort of like, ledger level of, hey, this is exactly what failed at this point and assess that and then figure out what the next step. It's always trade-offs, right? Do you want, do you want speed, right? Do you want to ship things really quickly to be really sure, right? Do you want maximum surety? Do you want speed or that quality, if you will? And I think it's up to individual business leaders and decision makers to decide that, but I think humans are probably best adept at determining where on that scale for mm -hmm. each individual business process they should be worried about. Whereas. I think the rest can certainly be, be automated away. Yeah. Thank you for having me here. I run the product organization NetSpy. I'm the chief product officer. Okay. And NetSpy is focused on what we call proactive security, uh, which is essentially helping our customers be better prepared, understand their IT estate, and be ready so that breaches don't happen. Mm -hmm. So proactive means doing it before anything bad happens. So all the hygiene you need, all the visibility, all the analysis beforehand, so you can fix what is potentially broken. Okay. So that bad things don't happen. Okay, great. Do you so want to- like getting your own like corporate house in order, if you will, from a security perspective? Yeah, and tracking it continuously. Mm -hmm. So two things, right? One is getting in order. Mm -hmm. And second is maintaining that visibility on an ongoing basis. So when things change, mm -hmm. and in networks, things change all the time. 
Mm-hmm. New devices come on the network. People download new software engineers, write new applications. Constantly, the, the IT estate is a very fast evolving and living, breathing um, thing. Yeah. And MA happens where new companies are integrated into your company, into yeah. your network. So, the sur- what we call attack surface, which is every element in your network which could be attacked devices, applications, people, all of those are considered parts of attack surface. And they're constantly evolving. So understanding what you have uh-huh. and keeping a constant finger on the pulse, maintaining that visibility, is step, step one, mm-hmm. ground zero for that. Mm-hmm. So we have a, a, a three-phased approach to this, where we call discover, prioritize, and remediate. This forms like the basis of proactive security. Okay. First and foremost, you discover everything in your network the address, um, applications, the devices, what is exposed to the internet, your web servers and other things, which ones are critical, your IPR is there, your data is stored, your HR databases, your finance databases, etc. People, who has access to what? So that's your discovery. And then you look for what is vulnerable. Sometimes software is vulnerable. Sometimes you do a patch update and it has a vulnerability. So you figure out all the areas where things are vulnerable and you map it against assets. Mm -hmm. So that gives you the end-to-end discovery of saying, okay, this is what I have, out of which these are the ones that are potentially at risk. Then you prioritize that risk and say of all the vulnerable assets, which ones are more vulnerable or more important to me? Mm -hmm. What is important to you in your network may not be the same to me. The Mm -hmm. same device, same application, same vulnerability may be much more important to you than to me because it's mission critical for you, but for me, it's sitting somewhere, I don't care discover and then prioritize and then once you know which ones are more important you go and fix them that's the remedy Mm -hmm. so that's what we focus on as a company Mm -hmm. and that's fine is prioritization difficult would you say is that the most difficult step of those three that you just listed it is (laughs) it is a challenge and and figured it out (laughs) i've been in this industry for more than 15 years close Mm -hmm. to 20 years building products for enterprise customers security products Mm -hmm. prioritization has always been the biggest challenge Mm -hmm. Lately, discovery is becoming more important just okay. because the attacks are becoming more frequent and smarter. Yeah. The bad guys are figuring out, right? They can figure out even the slightest of, of shortcomings, of exposures, even the smallest of vulnerabilities they're able to detect because it's all automated. Mm-hmm. Now, we think we are doing smart things with our products. Those guys are probably you know, as smart as we are. Yeah. Building attack tools. So lately, discovery has become more important so that you know what you have. But once you have know that, Prioritization still happens to be a challenge. Mm-hmm. And the industry is working towards it, getting better every day, but it is still a challenge. Mm-hmm. What would you say are the biggest challenges in the discovery portion and, and mapping the attack surface? Yeah, historically, we have um, looked at the external attack surface. What is exposed to the internet? Because that's what the bad guys see when mm-hmm. they come and attack you, right? And for the last several years, there's this technology called ASM, attack surface management. That's mm-hmm. evolved and it's becoming better and better looking at what's outside. But because of the sprawl and all the things we talked about, and and also look at the migration to the cloud, what used to be monolithic applications, your database server was one thing. Now it's a combination of microservices, Kubernetes workloads, and a bunch of other gateways. So the sprawl is almost unimaginable as applications move to the cloud. So internal visibility is becoming even more important. And the one other thing that is critical is every user on the cloud, an admin, has privileges that they never use. So if I'm a cloud admin, I probably have a hundred privileges or even even (laughs) hundreds of privileges. Yeah, You guys are laughing, you know this. (laughs) Oh yeah, if you spend any time with Google or AWS, you look at, yeah, IAM is its own thing in AWS and the the matrices of privileges are kind of insane. Yeah. yeah, especially think about me as a user. Mm-hmm. So I have my own privileges on AWS assigned to me by the administrator. I assume the role of an admin. Now the admin has bigger privileges. Yeah. Now there is an intersection between what I came with and what the admin has. Then I go and access a particular host or a server. It has its own access rights. Yeah. So now you're looking at a combination of what this guy allows, mm-hmm. what the admin has, what I have. And out of all of this, I may use two or three things in my daily work. And the other 90 or you know 200 or 300 other things I can access, permissions I have are never used. Mm-hmm. So if someone compromises my identity, yeah. now they have access to 300 things on the cloud. So 
there are so many things like this that makes internal visibility more and more critical. And that's a wrap on today's discussion. Huge thank you to Jacob, Teresa, Pukar, and Vinay on sharing their insights into vulnerability management, cyber resilience, and supply chain risk. We hope you enjoyed this deep dive into some of the most pressing topics in cybersecurity today. Don't forget to tune in next week for the third part of our series, where we'll be tackling threat intelligence and domain security. That's about all we have for this week. You can find us on Twitter at Domain Tools. All of the articles mentioned today will be included in our blog post, which can be found at blog.domaintools.com. Catch us every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific time when we publish our podcast and blog. That's it for this week. We'll see you again next week on another episode of Breaking Badness. Until then, remember, don't drink and click. <laughs>